Hello and welcome to Gardening Australia. This week, I'm 30 minutes from Melbourne CBD at the Heidi Museum of Modern Art. This place is nestled in 15 acres of gorgeous gardens and it's the perfect place to come for a stroll through the sculpture park. These gardens were designed with love and creativity, just like this week's show. I'm meeting a pair of botanists that have graduated from studying plants to turning them into a source of income and great joy. I'm embracing the bright side of life with some smashing colour just for your garden. And garden designer Hannah Maloney is back to show you her simple solution to gardening on a very sloping site. This little community garden is a recent addition to the patchwork of community gardens growing everywhere around Sydney. And immediately I'm taken by this place, a kid's nature play garden where they can really explore and learn about connecting with nature. But the other detail here is that there's so much mystery. It's been designed in a way that it lures you. Left, right, centre, middle. There's so much to see here. The Five Senses Garden in Rhodes Park in Sydney's Inner West has only been up and growing for a year, but it's big on its mission. The main emphasis for the garden is access and inclusion. I'm meeting Roman de Gucci, the garden coordinator at Inner West Neighbour Aid. Yes, yeah, so I work for a community organisation and what we do is we garden for people and offer social support to people in their own homes. It made me realise there were so many people in the community that were living quite isolated, but they had so much knowledge and passion. So it was really evident that if we could create a space that would bring these people more into the community. So that was a really key thing that we, we approached council and said, look, we need a space that's inclusive, that's accessible, and it's a space that older people can enjoy as well as young people. So they believed in it and they backed it, so they built it for us, and our um, job is to manage it now. There's a lot of food, that's for sure. Did you make something, Joe? The path is a really strong element and walking along, it kind of pulls it all together. Yeah, well, the path is a huge part of it. So the path is wide enough so if you're in a wheelchair or if you have a walker or if you're pushing a pram, you're able to access throughout the garden quite easily and that's a big part. And then as you sort of walk through the garden as well, there's a lot of native plant species that we planted just to highlight the beauty of our indigenous plants here, but also we've got a lot of mixture of things too. And I mean, this is classic yaya and nonna yeah. kind of plants with yeah. the, the lavender and the pelagonium. I mean, they're gonna relate to that and feel like it's a spot for me. Yeah. How's life as an elder? Well, it's quite good. Uh, I can get away with saying things to people. <laughs> What do you like about being out in the garden here? Well, to begin with, it's a very peaceful place. And uh, the emphasis on all the produce that's in the garden, it's been really heartening. Oh, I'll just... Uh, Look, I have some Tuscan kale and some Greek basil because I really wanted to hedge my bets with the nonnas and the yayas. I didn't want to offend my heritage, but I didn't want to put the Italians offside with me because then I wouldn't get lunch. You grow everything there. there. Yeah, echo, echo and alo, eki. This is going to be the Greek basil bed. Can I pay for you home, Con? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have to live on this. Fear. Fear just said, can, can, can she take me home? But it's for gardening, of course. Yes, yes. Gardening. Yes. I got a, a sort of a touch feel. Yeah. If it feels a little bit soft, then you know it's time it's to kinda, pick it. If right. it's gone hard, yep. then they've gone into seeds yeah, too. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The, the kind of seed. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. I want to take all you ladies to any planting job that I have to do because you're like lightning. <laughs> I just hand the seedling out. Bang. <laughs> Give me another one. Bang. <laughs> Give me another one. Bang. There you go. I have a garden. Zia, 
You're on fire. <laughs> Elsie, what what is this? This is a um, lime cheesecake. So I put a, yeah, a, a put bit of a dripping around, over yeah, this. Dripping Hope everybody likes it. But last time I made already once, and everybody loves it. Everyone loved it. Yeah. If it tastes as good as it looks, I can't wait. Yeah. What are you up to here? I'm cooking for dad. I made oh. one while I was waiting oh. for you. That looks nice. What's the technique? What, the what's technique the flavours? You grate your potatoes and your onion, and then you soak them in water to get rid of all the starch. Then you squeeze them, and then you put them in this. But unfortunately, this is not hot enough. Yeah, but that's all right because you can't blame your tools. This is no. this is the ultimate flavour and taste test. So yeah, if you can produce it on a dodgy burner. Then your recipe stands the test. Oh, of time. I am a good cook. If nothing else, I'm a good cook. <laughs> I think I was nothing like in the kitchen. a bit of shameless self-promotion. I like it. <laughs> what about here at Five Senses? What are you? What... Oh, Five Senses! It's the best day of the week. We really enjoyed. Everybody's so friendly. Everybody brings something and brings their stories. We really love it. Bravo! 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 Hey, look oh, at that! Look, look at, at that. that! That looks fantastic. Good design and plantings have created this space. But at the end of the day, the ingredient that binds it all together is the people. Yeah, the biggest part of the community space that it's created is having that big communal table where we all sit along and have a meal together. Because food brings people together. <laughs> Here you go, Cristela. Good. More food, more pasta. You all right? Mary, what can I get for you? Some pasta, You're having a bit of fuss all other, Roman. That stuff. Is that, that, is yeah. that the proper stuff? Yeah, that is that, that is the real deal. How is it? I mean. Cruzala's fasolada in Greece, to the hummus, then to the pasta and the frittata. I, I got jet lag at the moment. <laughs> I, I, seriously, I don't know what to eat next. But one thing's for certain, I've already applied to the council for a DA <laughs> because I'm going to put a residence upstairs and I'm moving in. You're not going to get rid of me. We'd love to have you. <laughs> is a perennial. A perennial plant is a plant that lives for more than a couple of years and you get them in both the ornamental and the vegetable garden. In the veggie patch, most plants we grow are annuals. They do their whole little life cycle in less than a year, things like basil. Some of them, they live for a couple of years and they're known as biennials. Perennials are those plants that persist year after year after year. And of course, there are many beautiful plants you can grow in the flower garden and also loads of perennial vegetables like rhubarb. People often ask, how do I know if a plant is a weed? Well, a weed is really just a plant in the wrong place. And there are also officially declared weeds and invasive species. And there are plenty of resources out there to find out what's what. Now, weeds can have a devastating effect on local ecosystems and plant communities. And with 65% of weeds being garden escapees, we really need to think carefully about our plant selections. But as most gardeners know, it's hard to walk past a weed without wanting to pull one out. If you live in a frosty area, it's really important you choose frost tolerant plants. But when selecting those plants, understand that if it says it's frost tolerant, it doesn't tell you what degree of frost tolerance the plant has. So a plant that will take minus one mightn't take minus two or minus four. And similarly, a plant that can tolerate minus four mightn't take minus six or minus eight. So the important thing is to understand how cold your frosts get, how many frosts you get in a season, and if they occur regularly or just occasionally, and then find out how frost tolerant your plant is. Onions are a really great home garden crop. There are different varieties that'll grow in different climates almost all year round, which means you can continually harvest. And some of them are really well suited to sowing straight from seed, but a lot of people start with seedlings. And they can be really fiddly to plant. They're like tiny little bits of string. I've got a simple method to make it a lot easier for you. 
So you just need to separate the onions out. I've soaked them in water to help and then carefully tease apart the little strings. And then instead of sticking every single onion string in one hole, you're gonna lay them down on the side of a trench. Just put the roots in the bottom and lean the onions all over one side. I'm putting them about five centimetres apart because in a few weeks, when they're getting a little bit bigger, I can harvest every second one. While the onions might look a little sad when they first go into the ground, over the coming weeks, they'll actually pull themselves up vertically. And that means they're gonna grow straight and sweet for your kitchen. I don't know about you, but I love flowers. My grandparents pollinated that passion back in my childhood. And with Mother's Day just around the corner, many people's thoughts are turning towards beautiful blossoms. Tino's tracked down a couple of botanists who know a thing or two about growing a colourful bunch. About an hour from Hobart in the Channel area of southern Tasmania is historically significant Putalina. And if you head down one particular long straight driveway in the area, you'll chance upon something quite unexpected. This is the Hut Flower Farm, a romantic European style picking garden and flower farm. It's both home and passion project for a pair of botanists and their twin daughters. Where did the garden start? So I, I wanted a European style picking garden, so I drew it on paper and, and I wanted it to be in these squares of colour. So I wanted a colour wheel of yellows, dark blues and purples, pinks and whites, but the design needed to be on a piece of flat ground. So I then went to Rob and I said, well, we need to terrace the, the pasture because it was just behind pasture. And so he spent all summer tediously hand terracing this. So what was the lamb like when you first got here? Oh. Crikey, it was a, a cow paddock, so just grass and a big sloping site, no trees on it at all. So everything here, you've planted? Everything. But you're not going into this blind, you've got a background in botany. Well, we both have uh, doctorates in botany, but in eucalypt genetics for the most part. I was always intrigued and wanted to play with flowers and grow flowers, so I guess despite the fact that I did study the native flora, and, and I find that very beautiful, but I wanted to grow old-fashioned roses and lilies and other annual plants, so yeah, it was an interest in, in beyond what I'd studied. So what made you go into business and start selling your flowers? Well, I ended up bringing in way more flowers out of this small cutting patch than I envisaged and kept filling the house. And yeah, sure, we'd give some away, but um, seeing that we're spending quite so much on our garden, we thought we might like to break even. <laughs> so, um, and you know, there has been a growing interest in you know more sort of garden style flowers for floristry. So we looked into it and started growing types of flowers that would be of use for um, florists. Do you also find, being a smaller scale grower, that you can sort of react to what your florists want? We are in touch with them and in the lead up to the season and as the season progresses about what's available. I send out regular emails with pictures of what's flowering now and, and that helps them pick in terms of colours and things. The garden has a really nice feel, like it's been well laid out. Surely there was a master plan or, or some kind of plan that you worked to? Uh, not really. So it's kind of organically grown as we've gone along. We have to fence for browsing pressure from possums and wallabies, so any garden needs to be fenced. So we started with the picking garden and the veggie garden, and then we've moved to having a white garden and the new flower field, and we're standing in the oldest part of the garden, which is our heritage apple orchard. Can't buy. Apples like this, I mean, Pink Ladies or, or Fuji's, but you can't buy a heritage apple, yeah. <laughs> mm. So what part of the garden are we in now? 
Vespertino. This was our veggie patch, but when I started getting more serious about flowers, I kind of took over. So sorry, Rob. But um, <laughs> so now it's full of dahlias, and you can see the sea holly and some sweet peas, and we grow a few other types of flowers in here. But it's um, a much easier way to harvest plants when you're in a very linear bed. So yeah, that's why we moved into this space as well. Marion and Robert may be spending all their time in the garden, but they're not working alone. Twins Maggie and Elizabeth get their hands dirty too. Do you have a favourite flower? Um, I like dahlias. Dahlias? They're I nice. like dahlias too. Well, we're going to make a posy. Big one in the middle. So, big one? One in the middle, and then you put one here. And you just sort of place them all together like that? Just keep turning into. Oh, so you twist them as you go? Ah. So Elizabeth, we've got a pink one here, and Maggie, I'm going to get this multicoloured one. Is that too much? Mm. <laughs> That's a yes, isn't it? And now uh, rubber band? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might get it over that one. Perfect. Wow. That's one of my first posies ever. What do you reckon? Good. Brilliant. We start a lot of our things from seed, a lot of the annuals that we have, obviously, and so I have grown seeds in the past as part of my study and not done a very great job of that and managed to kill lots of seeds and lots of seedlings. But now we start them in soil blocks in the glass house and then we grow them to the stage where we're happy to get them out in the ground and then wait for the right moment for getting them in the ground and having the bed prepped and then we plant them all out and then sort of waiting until they're big enough to flower. So there's always a bit of a, a lag time in between things but that's where perennials and things will come in so the perennials are usually flowering when our annuals are getting ready to. So um, yeah, it's part of the succession of flowering that we have in the garden. So it started out as a labour of love. You've turned it into a source of income. All work's done. No, Tino, <laughs> the job is never done. The garden's never finished. It's all a question of editing and change as plants grow and develop. Conditions change, your tastes change. The garden's never finished. But I can't imagine doing anything else. I'm always going to be here. I'm going to make a rosemary and lemon hand scrub. It's a great one for your green thumbs as well as your other fingers. It keeps them refreshed and cleansed and revitalised. It's using simple, affordable ingredients that you've probably got in your garden. All you need is a cup of sugar, some olive oil or coconut oil if you want to use that, zest from a lemon and two tablespoons of lemon juice and a couple of sprigs of rosemary. Put the sugar, the lemon zest and some roughly chopped rosemary leaves into a bowl. Then add the olive oil and the lemon juice and combine all the ingredients together. That really smells wonderful. The sugar is acting as an exfoliant the olive oil is the moisturiser and then the rosemary and the lemon juice have antibacterial and disinfectant properties. So all you need to do now is spoon that into a clean glass jar, keep the jar in the fridge and it will last for a good couple of months. That's taken no time at all to make. You can use it or if you want to, you can give it away. Dress it up a little bit with a tie and a tag and someone will really appreciate it because it's a homemade gift from the garden. For many of us, having birds in our backyards brings so much joy. But should I be feeding them? Is it good for them? It's just such a contentious issue. But never fear, because Jerry's found an ecologist who's written a book about feeding birds in backyards, literally. And he's got some great tips on guilt-free feeding. 
Gardens can give great joy. They can fill your life with fragrance, put food on the table, provide a habitat for native animals, and let birds of a feather flock together. As our cities and suburbs change, so too does the behaviour of our wildlife. Deciding to attract birds into the garden by putting out food for them requires some careful consideration. Griffith University's Professor Darrell Jones is an urban ecologist and he's an advocate for feeding birds responsibly. So why do people feed birds? Oh, it's a profoundly important thing for some people. It's a way of connecting with nature in a really simple way. You put out a little bit of food and these truly wild birds come to visit us in our own yards. It's fantastic. Wild animals come to us and that's for lots of people a really important experience it's a connection to nature and it's so easy to do that's the other thing so what got you interested in feeding birds i'm an urban ecologist i study wildlife in cities and it struck me almost immediately that everywhere i went i became aware that people were feeding birds whether it was you know grandma with the kids down at the park throwing the bread to the ducks or people feeding magpies in their backyards. There's a lot of people out there feeding birds. So if we do feed birds, will we change their behaviour? Oh, absolutely. But then again, we've changed everything about their la the landscape. We've, we've demolished their, their habitats, we've built houses and put in roads and all those sorts of things. So yes, putting out un unusual sorts of food to feed the birds, which is not what they normally feed on, will change them, but so has everything else we've done. So there are right things to do and wrong things to do with yes feeding. there are jerry and it's not very difficult um there, there are some simple small rules and if, as long as we take notice of them we, we'll be fine this is just a, a plastic dish that would go under a normal big pot plant and all i've done is attach it firmly to the corner of the balcony put a couple of holes in it it's the right sort of size for the big birds that would be able to come it's easy to uh, put the food in it's easy to see from, from, our, uh, from our kitchen there and easy to clean, which is the crucial thing. We sweep down any of the debris that was on there from the last, last time that we put some food out. I always wipe it down with some vinegar just to keep, kill anything that might be there. And the reason that we're doing this, and it's a crucial thing to do every single day, is to make sure there's no possibility of spreading any disease. So I've got my feeding bowls. What's the best type of food to use? Well, this might surprise you, Jerry, um, but normally everybody seems to think that, that seed is the go. And so you can get all sorts of commercial mixes of seed. There's a whole lot of different sorts of seed. But what you need to look for is a variety of different sizes of seed. They often have sunflowers, they have millets, they have all sorts of bits and pieces. There's a huge variety of them. Now, done a bit of research on this for our local birds, especially the lorikeets and the parrots which come to here. And you might be surprised to learn that they absolutely love blueberries, raspberries, chopped up apple, and even frozen peas, wow. which is extraordinary. Now, this is what I would give out for the week. So I vary it a lot. I put out some seed and some blueberries one day and then no seeds and chopped up apple the next day or bits of banana or whatever it might be. And you can see them come and they, that when they arrive, they go, what's today? I mean, what's this crazy stuff that's going on? And that's good because these birds are naturally eating an enormous variety of things and that's what we need to do. How much food is enough? That's a really important question because we have to remember that we're not trying to provide all the food that they need. It's a cup of tea and a Tim Tam equivalent, not a three course meal. So I've worked out that around about the amount is about a cup's worth, just a normal measuring cup's worth. This is not going to feed lots of birds lots of food, but this is just enough for them to bring them in, give them a little snack and off they'll go on their way. Traditionally, if you thought plants that bring in birds, you've always thought of the grevilleas and the calistamins and all those nectar-bearing yes. plants. We've now discovered that that's not necessarily the only thing. Some of the birds that come to those types of plants are the noisy miners and the rainbow lorikeets, and they, they tend to be just a small number of, if you like, aggressive birds that often keep them out. What we need to do is be more adventurous in, in what we have, 
And I'm even suggesting that we put in plants that attract insects. The insects that actually eat the plants, which is bizarre, isn't it? But if the insects come to eat the plants, the birds will come to eat the insects. Because although there are some birds which eat seed, the majority of birds don't eat seed at all. They're insectivorous birds. And what we now know is even birds, so-called honey eaters, most of the time eat insects. So we need insects to bring those kinds of birds in. So in summary, when feeding birds in the garden, not too much, keep it nutritious, be very, very clean, and then just enjoy it. How stunning is this? But I've got a question for you. If you had just one single pot to garden in, what would you choose to grow? Would it be beautiful blooms, luscious leaves? Well, Sophie's filling up on flavours. There aren't many gardens, courtyards or even balconies that wouldn't be improved by a collection of herbs. And some of the best absolutely thrive in pots. Lots of the perennial herbs with big impact flavour come from the same plant family, Lamiaceae. That includes plants like thyme, rosemary, oregano, sage, savoury and even mint and basil. Fragrant delicious leaves aren't the only thing this group of plants have in common. Many require similar growing conditions, which makes them perfect for growing in a large pot like this one, which has got a beautiful collection of different foliage sages, thymes and savouries. I'm in a nursery that has a lot of my favourites, so I'm gathering a tasty collection. First up, I want to plant some thyme. I've chosen a selection of thymes that have different foliages or flavours. This one's turkey thyme, which actually looks like common thyme, but it's a lot more compact in its growth habit, so better in a garden or in a pot. This one here would have to be my favourite thyme. It's called pizza thyme, and it has the flavour of thyme and oregano together, and then this one is variegated lemon thyme. Now, lemon thyme has a beautiful, fresh scent, which is wonderful in cooking. And I've also got some rosemary, hyssop and winter savoury. I'm going to plant them all in this pot. These perennial plants have a fairly shallow root system, so they'll grow well in a wide, shallow pot like this. Now, they need good drainage, so always use a premium potting media and even stand your pot onto pot feet to make sure that the water drains out freely. I've placed the prostrate varieties of thyme near the edge so they'll cascade over the sides. Rather than choose an upright form of rosemary that'll get too big, you can actually get a prostrate rosemary. These flower for many months, from autumn all the way through to spring. But there's another one that I'm going to use instead. This one here is called Mozart, and it's semi-prostrate. It will hang over, but give you a bit of height. But I love its dark blue flowers. Now, these times form low mounds, so I'm still going to put them near the edge, but they'll grow 20 to 30 centimetres high. Now, because you're going to be harvesting them for the kitchen, you'll keep them compact. But I'm just making sure that I've interspersed the foliage colours and the different textures. Coming into the cooler months, winter savoury is another great herb. It has this lovely dark green foliage with pretty little white flowers. It has a rather spicy scent and is beautiful used in cooking in the kitchen. Another underrated herb for winter pots is hyssop. Now, it has beautiful blue flowers and a rather strong scent. It's quite good paired with strongly flavoured meats or in soups and stews. Now, these two plants are slightly more upright and taller, so they'll be perfect in the middle. Once you're happy with the layout, then you can start planting. These plants are all sun lovers, so make sure you put your pot in a sunny position. And with so many plants growing in a relatively small space, be aware that the pot might need to be refreshed every year or so. Water it in well, but make sure not to overwater in the cooler weather. 
If you place a pot of these herbs outside your back door, you'll find yourself ducking outside to harvest them for the kitchen. These little leaves pack a punch and they're perfect for adding Mediterranean flavour to your cooking right through the cooler months. Still to come on Gardening Australia, Josh is getting ready for spring by planting a wildflower meadow. Hannah gets stuck into a job that's a bit of an uphill battle. And we meet an incredibly creative couple who design fabric inspired by Australian flora. Colour brings up memories, it excites, it surprises, and in a garden, it absolutely makes it pop. Most modern gardens are undeniably beautiful. They do rely on green lawns and discreet pastoral plantings. In my book, it's time to forget being subtle, get down to your nursery and go all out for colour. If you have a more traditional preference for your garden, go no further than the classic rose. There's so many to choose from, and this one is a beauty. It's La Sevillana, and you can see that it's bright, it's really vermilion red, and you can buy it either as a standard or a bush rose. Underplant it with some wonderful flower carpet roses that are vibrant in their colour as well. And the best thing about them is that they're virtually disease free. If you live in the tropical part of Australia, you'll realise just how good a hibiscus is in giving you colour for your garden. This one is a new cultivar of Hibiscus Rosa sinensis, and it's called Sunshine Yellow. Very appropriate. And it's beautiful because it's got depth given by that pink in the throat. This will actually grow as far south as Melbourne, given a sunny spot, even grown in a pot. And have a look at those buds that have come, really popping in your garden. Given a strong trellis or a fence to climb on, you can hardly beat a mandevilla. This really fits the bill because those trumpet flowers keep going all through spring and summer into autumn. They slow down a little bit in winter, but the colour of those flowers is just intense. You can get them in pink or scarlet or even white, but it's the really colourful ones that I love. A great southern lady, Scarlet O'Hara, and that's the cultivar name for this Bougainvillea. The flowers are those tiny things inside surrounded by these wonderful bracts, and that gives the colour. The Bougainvilleas, of course, are tropical. They love the heat, but they will grow in a really sunny spot with a brick wall or something to reflect the heat. Some people might think that native plants are a bit drab in the garden. Well. That is a myth. At any time of the year, you can find a native plant looking really spectacular. And some of the grevilleas, like this one, this is a cultivar called Catherine's Sister. And look at that. You can't complain about that, can you? The bees certainly love it. And birds, of course, too. But look at this one. This is called Blandfordia, and its common name is Christmas Bells. A beautiful little plant, just a tiny one, would suit a rockery or a inner container would be absolutely ideal. Well, that's pretty stunning, isn't it? This is an Australian native cutleaf daisy, Brachys comb multifida, and they are just a mass of flowers from spring right through till autumn. Their colour range is enormous. Whites, mauves, blues, pinks, absolutely phenomenal. And when they're finished flowering, you just get your secateurs or head shears and clip them back and they'll come again. They're great as a ground cover or as a thing to fill in in the garden. And this one is really special. 
It's called Mala Mala Thai Lotus. And have a look at that glorious combination of silver and purple. You couldn't get better than that. Nature does it well, doesn't it? This is a plant that's very special. It needs good, free draining soil. So I would grow it in a pot. Even in a shady spot, you can choose plants that will push through and give you colour. These are heucheras, and they're not commonly grown, but they're beautiful little knee-high perennial plants. And they'll grow well in the shade or part sun. They're little spiky flowers that are a little bit insignificant because it's the foliage that you're concentrating on. They come in all sorts of colours, lime green, metallic grey, mauve and purple, even plum. And they change from summer into winter in colour. They really are wonderful if you grow them en masse. Colour in the garden isn't just for looking at. Echinaceas like these in the vegetable or herb garden are great to bring pollinators, busy little bees. Just have a look at them. You've got amazingly deep burnt reds, hot popping oranges, pinks and screaming yellows. Look at me, they're shouting. Easy to grow. Echinaceas are really tough and a great cut flower also. No matter what kind of garden you have, never be afraid of pushing the colour wheel. You'll thank yourself forever. Wow, Jane, that is a mighty pop of colour. But there's so many different plants to choose from. What about a dazzling display of West Australian wildflowers in your garden this spring? Well, now's the time to plant, and Josh is going to show you how. Permanent plantings provide a garden with structure all year round, but every garden needs some seasonal showstoppers. And in WA, you can't get much more showstoppy than Everlastings. And while you can drive a few hours from Perth to see them, you can also plant them, even in the eastern states. And now is the perfect time to plant. Most WA annual wildflowers, including Everlastings, like plenty of sun. And out here, well, they certainly get that. In fact, this area I've purposely set aside and keep bare to plant out Everlastings each year, and I've always had good success. I'm preparing the planting site by raking back the mulch to expose the soil underneath. Making furrows with this hoe breaks up the soil and will ensure good contact between the seeds and the soil which is needed for germination. These are my everlasting seeds. The species is Rhodantha chlorocephala rosea, or pink paper daisy. You can see the seeds are very light. These little fluffy things have the seed inside them. There's also some flower chuff there. So when you're sowing these, you've got to be really careful they don't blow away. You need to sow fairly liberally if you want a mass display. I'm scattering seeds across the whole area and into the furrows, which help to trap the seeds. Even though these Everlastings are natives, they're still annuals, so appreciate a bit of fertiliser, like this blood and bone. The seeds will germinate within one to two weeks and grow quickly on winter rains. If you have a dry spell, give them a good hand water and keep the area weed free because they hate competition and watch out for snails too. If you follow those simple tips, come late winter, early spring, you will have the most magnificent swathe of blooms that will last for months.
You may remember our guest presenter from last year, garden designer and educator Hannah Maloney. Alongside partner Anton and little legend Frida, <laughs> Hannah's been building a productive garden paradise overlooking Hobart with simple solutions to common garden challenges. Today, Hannah's coming to grips with gardening on a slope. I love our garden. It's close to the city and it has some of the most sunny and stunning views imaginable. But it does come with a few issues. In particular, it is far from flat. Gardening on a slope is generally a bit harder. Everything takes longer and is more expensive. Now, in our garden, ideally, we'd have loved to terrace everything with beautiful stonework to stop water shooting off down the slope and taking the nutrients with it. Unfortunately, our dreams and our budget didn't quite line up. So in the process of being a bit more creative, we found an affordable solution, which is the heat-treated recycled pallet. We've built some large earth banks with an angle of approximately 30 degrees. We've then placed the pallets directly into the slope to stabilise it and create instant structure that we can plant into straight away. They've worked so well for our slope. They've helped all these plants get established with water and nutrient being held higher in the slope in all these nooks and crannies. And today, I'm gonna to show you how you can do it as well in your own steep garden. Now, the first thing you need to do when you're going to build your pallet bank is find your pallet. We find ours from local tip shops, warehouse sites or building sites. Importantly, when we choose them, we're making sure they all have a really good little stamp which says HT. That stands for heat treated pallets. It means there's no nasty chemicals in this, which means that your garden won't have any nasty chemicals in it too. This is where we're going to put our demonstration pallet garden today. And as you can see, we've prepped the site to make sure it's ready for the pallet to be nestled into the slope. Importantly, we've chipped off the top layer of the grass so there's not a thick grass mat there that can just spring up between the pallets and be impossible to weed later on. With the ground nice and clear, it's now time to secure that pallet in place. pegs do a fantastic job of holding the pallet on the slope to make sure it doesn't slide away. The other ace thing about them is that they can just rot in place like the pallet and by that stage the plant's roots have kicked in and they're holding the slope together instead of the pallet. Once that soil is nice and packed into the pallet, it's time for some of this mulchy compost goodness. Okey-dokey, now we're up to the fun bit where we get to actually plant something. Today we've got these beautiful native creeping boobiella plants. And these are fantastic choice for this pallet garden because they're really hardy, they don't need much love. The other awesome bonus about them is that their foliage will eventually drape down like one big blanket and smother that pallet so you don't even see it. So, let's get started.
12 months time, that small pallet garden will start to look like this. And when it flowers, the white or pink flowers are so gorgeous. Overall, working with pallets on our steep slope has been enormously helpful for us. And it might be too for you. Australian plants have inspired artists for tens of thousands of years. Their beauty has been depicted in ancient rock art, on canvas, and now on the clothes we wear. I reckon you're gonna love this. The quirks of Australian flora, we could talk about ad nauseum for the next three weeks. Like, you could really thrash it out. They're unlike anything else. I'm very proud of them. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I can add anything to that. <laughs> I'm Bruce Slorick. I'm one half of Utopia Goods, design studio and manufacturer of textiles and other home furnishing products. I'm the artist hand of the business. It's an ongoing... Mission. Mission. To, to take come. Australian fabrics to the world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm Sophie Tatlow, and together with Bruce, we are on a mission to make Australian native-inspired fabrics. We live in Sydney, and so we want to kind of celebrate that. And We don't want to be statist. So we have to dip into Western Australia. We have to dip into Victoria being ex-Melburnians. But I guess, really, it sort of focuses on the beauty of the plant, regardless of where it's from. The other thing is we wanted to celebrate colour. I mean, I've got a bit of a personal joke, life's too short for grey, unless you're short and grey. And, you know, colour is so wonderful and exciting and colour makes people, for lack of a better word, happy. You know, it's very joyful. The model car is a really popular design that we did and I mean it's quite incredible plant. You know and that fig print's fantastic it's plump and it's very graphic and the leaves are great. I mean we've also done an angophora which when you really look at them they almost look like a cherry blossom and then we did a wattle because that's obviously a national symbol. This is where it all started yeah. and this hangs above my head downstairs in the store and the great thing about this is that a lot of clients and customers look at it and all of a sudden the penny drops when they can see the print. So there's the bird, it appears the first time, and the negative space here. You can see it repeat itself and you can see it on the left and the right. And then six months later, fingers crossed, we have the result of that print and this is the textile. It's a homage to our beautiful eucalyptus and a honey eater. I like to think we're a bit like fabric farmers and it like it has a season with a really authentic production behind it. We're hand printing in India with some of the best artisans in the world. It takes between nine months and a year to produce one print. It's slow textiles. It's in a way anti-fast fashion because we really were trying to work against the idea of anything being throwaway and I think we're still on track with that philosophy. Early when we first started, I discovered this guy, Stan Kelly, who was a train driver and a self-taught botanical artist. And he, he used to go around you know, on the trains and like jump off the train and grab branches of eucalypts. Oh, the oh sorry, and the train was speeding ahead with all the passengers <laughs> and stands pulling out a eucalyptus well, you know, I think, I think in, Can you imagine? I think there it goes, have to paint this one. I think that, that in the 60s going around Victoria, the, you know, the trains were probably going quite slow, but, you know, and he's got this incredible cross-section of, and it just shows you all the beauty from the different sizes of the leaves, the shapes of the leaves, everything about them. I actually use this book sometimes as inspiration and propose to Sophie, oh, we should do this. And so it's a great subject matter. I always think I could never run out of things to, to paint. This is a eucalyptus youngiana. It's in a loose family of large fruit mallee. So for this design, we kind of worked on a kind of graphic decorative outline and, and detail and quite a simple palette of colours with a, a few highlights. 
The work that we do is, is really informed by a lot of decorative arts traditions and I was just obsessed by the idea of kind of using the firewood tree. Sophie really wanted to do it in more geometric design and so we created a very kind of geometric, very traditional textile. And it's this beautiful oceanic green. It was actually really interesting because we just printed the sampling and then I took it away. And our US market was like, wow, that's amazing. What is it? And I was like, oh, it's a figment of our imagination on linen. <laughs> I, didn't say, I didn't say that, but it's like there's a lot of layers. And I guess you could ask any creative what is it behind that you're doing. But outside of just illustrating and printing it, there's like probably six well, months yeah, of conversations. I mean, wow, we're sounding like interesting people. Aren't but we? I mean, the thing, <laughs> the thing about it is, it's so, I mean, it looks incredibly abstract, but they're the most yeah. kind of wild looking thing. A lot of Australians, you know, we look at the other as being better than being here, whereas what we have here is actually absolutely fantastic. And when you look at Australian native plants, they're so beautiful and unusual and they just have this kooky quality to them. It's like, what's not to love? They've got so much personality. And when you think of Australia, it has such a kind of an incredible visual identity. I mean, it's the blue sky, it's the landscape, it's the plants, it's the animals. They're the things that actually really kind of tie us to this place. As the weather cools down, you know how to warm up, get to work in the garden. Here's some jobs to get your heart rate pumping this weekend. In cool temperate gardens, construct a simple cold frame, which is essentially a glass-topped box. Cold frames trap heat and humidity, perfect for successful seed raising and propagation. Why not plant up a prezi for Mother's Day this Sunday? A woven basket planted with a mix of delicious healthy herbs like parsley, coriander, sorrel and viola are sure to impress. Got a shady spot that needs a lift? How about a hosta? These lush perennials are prized for their showy architectural foliage and do wonderfully well in pots or partly shaded beds. In warm temperate areas, winter is planting time for bare root fruits and ornamentals. So get your soils prepped by digging through lashings of aged composts and manures. There's nothing sweeter than the winter scent of Baronia Megastigma, so give one a go at your place. These fast-growing natives do well in pots in protected, partly shaded spots. Take the bore out of your coleslaw and plant out red savoy cabbage, forming nice tight heads to about one kilo. These ripper reds are great for smaller gardens and dead easy to grow. Subtropical gardeners, crank your cocktails and sass your sandwiches with some salad burnet, an easy to grow perennial herb with a refreshing cucumbery taste. If the foliage tips of your staghorns appear chomped and munched, it's likely the work of the staghorn beetle larvae. Check plants each morning and remove the large white larvae. Whether you love productive plots, awesome ornamentals or cute cottages, it's the perfect time to find some ideas and inspiration in open gardens. In tropical gardens, it's turmeric time. As lower leaves start to yellow and stems dry, clumps of rhizomes can be lifted from the soil to be used fresh, replanted or dried and stored. Whether you use cardboard and wood chips, sand, gravel, pavers, timber or even turf, pop in a garden path or two, just perfect for keeping wayward feet out of your foliage and flowers. If your fuchsias are more gloom than glam, it's time for a prune. Fuchsias flower on new wood, so cutting leggy limbs back by about two thirds should see a smashing show. Tough, attractive, tolerant and colourful, perennial salvias are the perfect plant for arid zone gardens. Plant in groups, in a border or pots for a full-on floral show that lasts for months. Silverbeet is the ultimate cut and come again edible, ready to harvest now. Remove outer leaves as required, leaving the younger leaves in the crown to develop for your next meal. For a dry shady spot, why not whack in a butcher's broom? An attractive evergreen shrub with unusual leaf-like cladophylls and flowers instead of traditional foliage. Happy Mother's Day to all the wonderful mums out there and let us know how you spend your weekend in the garden on our Facebook page.
Well, that's all we have time for, but we'll be back next week with plenty of new growth and full of flavour. Have a great day with your mum. We'll see you next time. When it comes to moths, well, most of us are a bit in the dark. Thank you.